Mikey Bertels, a professor of genetics and well-being as well as behavior. You have to explain at least. I love the whole combination of genetics, behavior, and environment, yeah. and of course, well-being. Uh, thank you so much for for being with us uh, at this uh, this forum, uh, the World Happiness Accord and the World Happiness Fest come together, you know, to bring ideas like yours and your thinking and your insights to life to as many people as possible. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you for uh, the invitation. Very nice to join. So I would love to, to go straight into the state of genetics. Um, what do we know today that we didn't know 25 years ago? What's really going on with genetics, uh, behavior, and environment? Yeah, well, um, what we didn't know 25 years ago is that genes play an important role in human beings and human behavior. Um, and we learned initially from twin studies um, by observing identical twins and looking how much they are alike and comparing that to dicyclic twins. We learned that there is a inheritability estimates in well-being, which means that 40% uh, of the differences between people in their levels of well-being is accounted for by genetic differences. So it's, a, it's about a population and you look at why is one person happier than the other. Some of the differences come because they have a different genetic makeup. Um, based on these uh, twin studies results that uh, have been done all over the world, so it's, it's a rather fixed estimate, um, we added real DNA material, which you can from blood or from the inside of your cheek. Uh, and that material was used to show that there are specific locations uh, in your genome uh, that explain differences in, uh, in happiness or well-being between people. So from giving an estimate based on twin data, we are now digging into the DNA uh, and find locations. So you, so you say that 40% of well-being and happiness, how do you differentiate between well-being and happiness? Is happiness subjective well-being? Yeah, well, for, uh, for these kinds of studies, you need really large samples. So we uh, combine it. We also did different studies with happiness, satisfaction of life, quality of life. And from a genetic perspective, it loads on the same component. So there's not much difference. So basically, 40% of our well-being and happiness is determined by genes. That means that well, it, it's a bit different. It, it's forty percent of the differences between people, all of the genes. Things. And if you go to an individual, uh, we actually don't know yet because uh, if you want to know it at an individual level, you need your DNA. And some people have a high genetic predisposition for happiness, while other people have a low genetic predisposition. So, so something that we've been learning for, for a few years is some research shows that 50% of happiness is determined by genes, 40% by behavior, 10% by the environment. I guess that you, you don't completely agree with that, right? No, that, that's, uh, that's the happiness pie that's used a lot. Uh, the happiness pie itself is, is correct. Uh, for example, as used by Sonia, uh, Leon Bermierski, but she also explained that it's used to explain variance or differences between people and can't be translated to an individual. Exactly. But important is that uh, if something is in the genes, it doesn't mean that it can't change. So you can have a high genetic predisposition for happiness and you have a relatively easy life because you have a basic happiness feeling. But if you have a low position, you still can be happy. If you know what makes you happy, if you do the right intervention, if the environment treats you well, you can still become a happy person. 
So this is, this is very important to clarify because um, sometimes we, we get into, we jump into, this is, this is a choice, happiness is a choice, but we know as well that there is predisposition and there are conditions, right? So if we want to have a full awareness and perspective, we really have to understand all, at least all three levels, right? If you, a, a very nice parallel that, that works for people a lot is if you uh, talk about uh, physical activity or exercise. If you look at a group of people, we all have a different predisposition for building uh, your oxygen use while exercise. Some people can run a marathon without training. Other people can train for ages and never will be able to run a marathon. Because your physiology is different. If you take such a group of people, they start at a different beginning. If you give them all the same training program, they will all move. They will all increase their physical health, but not at the same level. And that's the same for well being. Some people have a high genetic predisposition, some have a low, and you can train everybody. But for some, it's harder to shift than others. This is very, very interesting because um, what we are understanding here is that um, the individual, depending on the community where they grow and depending on the environment and the conditions, can get to one level of highest potential or not. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's this interplay between your genetic predisposition and the environment, uh, and the environment responds to you, uh, and that's also based on your genetic predisposition. For example, if you have a very happy face, uh, due to the position of your eyes, the shape of your mouth, you can have a more happy face, and people respond more happy to you. Completely genetic, because shape of your face is genetic. Um, so there's a lot of interplay. And there are also, for example, environmental effects that are uh, very strong for some people and not for others. Simple example is if the sun is shining and you are outside with a group of people, some will burn and others will not. That's due to the pigmentation of your skin. Your skin is genetic, the sun is environment, the outcome is the interface. Super interesting. I, I, I can imagine how much fun you're having with this topic. It, yeah. Because it's very complex, right? Normally people like input, output without seeing the system. But I think yeah. that you are getting into the interconnections of the system. I really, yeah. I really love it. So because it's complex, you get into systems. How, how easy it is to come up with, with kind of theories uh, that actually uh, can be proven? Is that, is that difficult? Uh, yes, it is difficult because we mainly focus on differences between people. So the outcome is actually, on one hand, is simple. Everybody is different. So there is no one size fits all. Uh, and it's important to recognize that genes do play a role. Which makes it really hard to say what you have to do or what is important for individuals. Um, so it's all kind of easy to puzzle. And at one point, we hope that with like the first nice medicine movement, stratified medicine, we also will have stratified prevention, for example. Uh, and, and well, in the end, help everybody to become happy. Fascinating. Have you, have you done research as well in the epigenetics space? Can you explain a bit what is, what is epigenetics and what, and, and what is the influence on, on happiness and well-being? Yeah, well, uh, epigenetics is, um, we are all born with our DNA sequence. And that's in every nucleus of our cells. So in every cell, you have your whole DNA sequence. That's fixed. You get 50% from your mother, 50% from your father. And it doesn't change. There's a tiny layer. One of the epigenetics mechanisms is a tiny layer around this 
the strand DNA, and that's your DNA methylation. Is methylation covers your DNA or does not cover your DNA? If it's covered, it can't be read. Simple if you have a book with letters and you cover it up, you can't read it anymore. So you can't read the book. If that's done with the DNA, you can't read the DNA, so it can't express itself. This layer of methylation is not fixed. So it can change due to environmental circumstances. So that means that you can actually influence, or the environment can influence, the expression of your genotype. So even if you carry the genes, they should be expressed if they need to have an effect. If they're not expressed, they don't have an effect. And this level of methylation can be changed. Um, we looked at methylation differences for well-being, or in this case, it was quality of life. We found a couple of spots uh, where we saw different methylation in the ones that scored higher versus the ones that scored lower. But the studies are a bit too small yet to, to draw strong conclusions. Um, one of the complex things is that the strong effects that have been found for methylation so far in any human phenotype is uh, a very strong effect on methylation. Mm. Um, and others are extreme environmental circumstances. So, for example, there have been studies in the hunger winter during the Second World War in Amsterdam, and you see effects on epigenetics. So it's still hard to sort out if the everyday environmental influence that we encounter uh, in the Netherlands now, for example, have a strong effect on methylation or not, beyond the effects of smoking. So it's wow. on ongoing. It's ongoing, and I I never some I read some research about the impact of thoughts on genes and epigenetics. Is that what do we know about that? Is does it really have an impact on changing our genes at all? Or not? Yeah, well, it will not have an impact on changing our genes because that's that sequence that's fixed that will not change. It could have an impact on epigenetics. Uh, I I'm not aware of. A really strong studies that show that, but you can imagine that based on your thoughts and based on behavior that's linked to your thoughts, that there could be changes of the layer of methylation. Um, I'm, I'm not sure because you need relatively strong effects and, and the effects are mostly on many locations, so it's really hard to distinguish uh, any direction of causation, or if there is really a direct link from one to the other. Uh, really interesting, uh, and I and I feel that we are still in a state where we can learn much more than we are learning. Right. Uh, yeah. So what 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 how what can we say that is kind of definite about the research that we've done over the last years that can help us. Uh, have interventions, for example, for mental health, yeah. on on how we evaluate activities, policies, and the way we and the way we live. Yeah. Well, most important is that due to the fact that we know that genes play a role, and that your genetic background is more or less a random process, is that we are all different. So there is not one intervention. Uh, this is very important because um, that means that people should find out themselves what works for them. So, uh, for example, for some people, a yoga class will have an effect. For other people, it will be mindfulness. For other people, it will be things like count your blessings or letters of gratitude. Or, But nobody can decide for you what works. So I think it's really important to realize that you can try things. You also should stop it if it doesn't work. So it's not that yoga is good for everybody. Yoga works for some people, not for others. Uh, but it has such a strong push now that, that everybody thinks, oh, I need to do yoga. It needs to make me happy. But that's not the case. So I think the most important message from the genetic research is that we are all different. Um, Another important message is that we should learn way more about the environment 
and environmental effects for individuals. So we have large studies saying people are happier in greener environments or people are happier in cities or not in cities. But that's all big factors that are maybe important for some but not for others. So we need to listen to individuals and ask people what makes you happy and not assume that everybody will be happy when they start running or that everybody will happy in a, be happy in a green environment. Because it's very individual specific. So we need to help people to learn to know uh, themselves. This is, this is um, fascinating as well when we, for example, think about working environments. Um, now we try to bring different activities to work that we think and expect are going to have an impact on employee engagement and behavior. But however, if it might not work, right? Because yeah. some people would say, well, that's nice, but it's not for me. Exactly. And I think that, that uh, if you want to change something in the work environment, you start uh, first have to ask people what they like. So there are a lot of big companies, uh, also in the Netherlands and in Europe, that build in exercise programs and say, okay, everybody come on exercising. It's good for health and mental health. And some people really, really don't like exercising. So they have an extra burden. Um, so you first should ask people, you can push people a bit. It's not that you should leave everybody in its own comfort zone. It's good to push people to the edge and say, well, give it a try. But also be honest that if it doesn't work, or if it makes people unhappy, to stop it for certain people. And I think especially the second step of stopping it and, and uh, realizing that it's not making everybody happy, I think that's, that's the thing that's missing at the moment. So in this case, um, if we consider behavior, environment, and, and the genes, uh, where do you start if you want to make fundamental change? in people what do you have to do uh, listen to people and and guide people to give them the opportunities to follow their own track and that's that sounds relatively easy and it's really hard because there's a big push from society i think in every country with a lot of expectations and most of these things uh, are just based on that everybody is the same. It's really hard in the Netherlands to say, well, I'm, I'm not going to go to university, although I'm the smartest at high school, because I do like to make only make music, for example. And everybody said, well, you're crazy. How are you going to earn your money? Well, if you only make music and you're very happy, you don't either need that much money or you will make money anyway. Um, so it's, it's really hard for people to get off the beaten tracks. And I think we should start, for example, in schools to open up the curriculum and say, okay, you have now this month in every year and we support you in everything you want and just try. Go dancing, singing, reading, writing, uh, everything that a human being can do, just support it and let people explore the world. It sounds easy because people need to earn money, they need to feed their children uh, and everything else. So it's in the idealistic world, but I think we should aim for it. Absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. Um, and I feel that awareness is probably one of the first steps in order to make profound change. Awareness about yourself and awareness about what's really going on around you. How yeah. would you, how, how much would you recommend that actually we are aware of our genes, the meaning and the predisposition that we have as individuals uh, towards happiness and well-being? Is this something that we should all, all know as individuals? Does it help at all? That's a very uh, complicated issue and, and we're dealing with that not really now but in the near future because based on the genetic studies, we will soon be able to calculate an individual genetic score. It's already used in the field of cardiovascular disease, for example. You can re uh, calculate a cardiovascular disease genetic risk score. So do you have a high risk or not? People like to know that because if you have a high risk and you adapt your lifestyle, you can 
protect yourself against getting a cardiovascular disease. For well-being, that's of course a bit harder, and it's it's still unknown if people would like to know. So if you have a high genetic load, that's good to know. It's easy. But the other side of the coin is with the people with the low genetic load. I still think that in uh, the future, for example, for people with depressive symptoms, it could be very helpful because if you know that you have depressive symptoms and you uh, are going to search help, you go to the clinic, and they know that you have a high genetic load for well-being, they can give you positive psychology intervention instead of behavioral therapy to get rid of your depressive symptoms. So they can focus on your strengths. If they see that you have a low genetic load uh, for well-being, they shouldn't take that part of the intervention. Then probably maybe medication helps them. So it could inform uh, the personalization of, of therapy as well uh, and of prevention at some point. So I'm, I'm, I love data and I think uh, everybody should know as much about himself as possible, but other people are way happier by not knowing a lot. Uh, so that's also more or less a personal choice. Yeah, actually right now there are several companies that uh, they give you your, yeah. your, your information, right? Yeah. It, and, and, and it's not really uh, costly in any way, but but somehow, if, if we think, and we, as you were saying, that we are so unique, uh, understanding the uniqueness for good and for bad could be a nice example. It's like when we do 360, when we do coaching and we do 360, and we do um, understanding strength finders, for example, yeah. uh, that is more about who do you think you are or, how, or where you are. In this case, if we know that there are so much determination in many ways by our genes, probably it makes sense that, that we know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really hard because uh, the interpretation is really hard. So I did all these things for myself, also with companies, just to see what happens. Uh, and I'm, of course, fully aware of what it means. So I get a, a, a risk score for certain things. And if it's positive, I really like it. I think, oh, well, that's nice. Uh, I have a high score for educational attainment, for example. Not really surprising, but still nice. But the things that give me a low score, I think, oh, well, that's, that's probably not reliable. And even by working in this field every day, it's hard to work with a certain risk because it doesn't mean that, it's, that it will happen. But as human beings, we are very, uh, we, we can't distinguish a risk from it's going to happen to me. Um, so it's also the interpretation of the information that's still really hard for um, people. So. Hey, and, and this is very much related as well to, uh, well, uh, Loretta Brown is one of those researchers that has been doing a lot of work in around the chemistry of the brain. Um, and, and we know that somehow our brain, and this is something, a question as well for you from a genetics point of view, how predetermined we are to negative thoughts. Because it looks like a, if we have 10 good ideas or 10 good comments in a meeting, and there is one bad comment, we are gonna focus on the bad comment. And there's some research about that. Yeah. But that is more related to the chemistry of the brain than to genes. How yeah. how can we how can you explain this? Is is it true at all? And how is this related to genetics? Yeah, well, of course, most of the chemistry of the brains is directly linked to genetics because the chemistry is the outcome of your genetic profile in combination with the environment. So the genes are directly involved in these mechanisms. Um, but this environmental factor that's also important is, for example, based on culture and based on what we're used to. Uh, and that's why uh, positive psychology interventions uh, work for some people pretty well, because it helps to change this uh, general tendency of focusing on the negative part. But due to the genetics, some people are more flexible in changing than, than others. So some people are more flexible 
uh, to either go against uh, their uh, brain physiology uh, or are better able to focus on positive versus negative stuff. Um, so there is a direct link between the brain and the genes and the environment is also very important. And everybody's brain is different. So um, there's a, a lot of improvement possible, but not for everybody. Wow, it looks like complex in many ways, right? <laughs> um, actually, uh, just a couple of days, I was talking to one of these futurists that has been doing a research, and there's some research in Japan as well, that actually uh, we more. I'm losing the sound. I lost the sound. I can't hear you anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 Now you're back. Sorry, I lost the sound. You yeah. talked about you did met the futurist, and then uh, I couldn't hear you anymore. Yeah, and, and he was mentioning about this research going on in in Japan around the impact and the uh, intervention on genes in order to stop the basically getting older. Uh, yeah. And there is a actually.